Yeah, yeah. Just a copy. Yep. When you're ready. We have a stick where it's I don't know how big it is, but it should work. Well, there's not, there's only like a couple of pictures, and they're not photos, so it shouldn't be too bad. But the message is. Yeah, pretty cute. At least it's a good strike. And the message is travel mug. Is he being rude? <laughs> <laughs> I think he's saying I was a bit slimmer back then. <laughs> or had more hair or less grey or... <laughs> no, I think it's quite a... <laughs> <laughs> it's a fair call though. It was, uh, um, in fact, because um, of COVID, no one, no, no one that I've worked with has seen me for quite a while until like a couple of months ago. Mm. And, and they I just think they were like, what has yeah. Mick been doing? Liver in a bakery. <laughs> <laughs> so that one, isn't it? It must be dry. What, how big was it? Can you take that and can you open up there? Yeah, you can just do the first four verses of the Lord's Mother. Uh, was the Matthew one that I was referring to. Anyway. Well, the, the wording around that is slightly different. One is, so in it, as in heaven, so in earth. Okay. And that's the other one that people think they're going to do. this open. Thanks, Pete. All right, Pete, just get down here then. What, take this? Yeah.
Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and those that are watching online to uh, tonight's seminar on heaven or hell, earth is God's reward. So we'll firstly begin with a prayer, if you'd just all like to stand. Come forward. We come before you at this time, Heavenly Father, to thank you for the many blessings that you give unto us day by day. Thank you for the sunshine and the rain. We especially thank you for the opportunity that we have to come together and read from your word, the Bible, to learn and understand those things that you have recorded for us. We pray that you will help us to understand your message so that we might be able to take it into our lives and that we might come to a better knowledge of you and your son. We leave this meeting in your care as we offer this prayer now through the name of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> so... Um, as I mentioned, the uh, seminar this evening is The Earth, God's Reward, Not Heaven or Hell. And Mr Mick Lyons will shortly uh, give unto us his thoughts, as, or not his thoughts, but the, the things that he has gained from the Bible in relation to that. But before we get started, read for you from Matthew chapter 6. We'll read the section to do with the Lord's Prayer and we'll begin at verse 5 and read through to verse 15. Matthew 6 verse 5. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, Neither will your father forgive your trespasses. So now ask Mick to come forward and speak to us about Earth's reward, God's reward on Earth. Thanks, Jim. Good evening, everyone. Just uh, going to plug my phone in because I'm using it as a... Uh Hot spot at the moment, I'm really sorry. Hopefully that doesn't interrupt anything. Uh, thanks for coming out, everyone, tonight. Um, sorry about that. Thanks for coming out, everyone. We've got an interesting uh, topic tonight, and it's a big topic, And but I think we can cover it in one night. Um, and I guess the best way to start this, have, have I got a pointer or a, just going to have to do it the old-fashioned way here? Um, 
I guess the best way to start this is to approach it from um, what what do what, what do most people believe, and I guess there's some a lot of confusion about what people most people do actually believe. Um, I've got some stats here from a study that was taken um, relatively recently in 2018, I think it was. Um, and if you, it's broken up by country, you've got USA on the left and Australia on the right, and it's also broken up by religion, which is quite interesting. Um, so if you look at the top bars there, the red and the blue, um, the blue bars are the proportion that believe in heaven. The red bars are the proportion that believe in hell. So it's interesting, um, if you look at the top right bars, you might not be able to read it from where you are, I'm sorry, but the top right in the, the Australian... Um, um, graph there on the right um, is no religion and 26% of people with, who call themselves an atheist still actually believe in heaven so they believe in some sort of reward um, it would seem and 15% of people who mm -hmm. are atheists who have no religion don't declare themselves as having a religion um, still believe that there will be some hell or some punishment coming it's interesting because um, you would think that, that that proportion of people wouldn't probably believe anything. And then you look down to the next set of people, the Roman Catholics, and it's you would think that they would 100% believe in both heaven and hell. But it's interesting, only 60% of Roman Catholics seem to believe in heaven, and only 40%, 46% of um, Roman Catholics believe in hell. So there seems to be some confusion around... Um, heaven and hell and um, we're, we're actually presenting an alternative to that and that is that neither heaven nor hell are God's reward it is actually the earth that is God's reward and we will seek to, to seek that out tonight um, just to get it off the mark on a, a light note I guess too not only is there so much confusion but there's even people who um, like it says there, Shirley McLean is right. I believe I had previous lives and I believe in a life after this, but what I can't believe is that this current life is happening. So people, some people are prepared to believe anything except their current life. So it just seems um, it's a confusing topic, so let's um, try and get some clarity around it. So um, how should we look at it? I've tried to break up a bit of a plan here for tonight. Um, the first thing I'd like to look at is why it's important. Um, why is this subject important? Does it matter what we believe? Are we going to heaven or hell or earth? Um, the second thing, because the title for tonight, which was given to me, um, was um, the earth is God's reward, not heaven and not hell. Um, there seems to be three sections to that topic. So the, the next section I'm going to look at is um, God's kingdom on earth and try and prove that it is going to be on earth. And so we'll look at that in f five different ways. We'll look at what God says from the Bible. We'll look at what Christ said from the Bible. We'll also look at what the disciples believed. We'll look at the covenant, that the promises that were made to Abraham. And also we'll look at some prophecy that would indicate that um, the earth is God's reward. And then we'll finish up briefly, um, just on a few verses, what, which prove that it can't be in heaven and it can't be in hell okay so let's start I'm just gonna plug my newly found device in yeah. let's start with um, why is it important to believe um, why is it important to have the right belief okay well it's important because um, we need to know what to believe so we can know and believe in God's plan to, so we know what God's future plan is and so that we can believe it. The second reason is so that we can know what our reward might be for, for the, our future, good or bad, and um, so that, like the disciples, we can teach people correctly, rightly, about God's plan and we have been tasked with that to preach to others, so we need to teach, teach them the right thing, not the wrong thing. So, um, it's important because um, Christ left his disciples with a message, with a, a, a task in his last 
um, words to them, captured in Mark chapter 16. And in verse 15 he says to them, Go ye into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptised will be saved, and whoever does not will be condemned. I'm just realising I've got pink polka dots on my cup here, I'm sorry. <clears throat> so that was, um, that was Christ's task to his disciples, which was to proclaim the, the gospel. So I guess the next question that follows on from that is, what is the gospel? Well, Acts 8 captures it really nicely. Um, and in Acts 8 verse 12 it says, But when they believed Philip as he preached good news <coughs> pardon me, about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptised, both men and women. So can you see the link there? Philip was preaching, then they were believed, they must have believed, and they were baptised. So this, 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 what we're told there is that the, the gospel must be that bit in the middle of there, he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. That must be the gospel because on hearing that and believing it, they were baptised, both men and women. And in Acts, Acts chapter 28, he, it also says, he lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all those who came to him proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching them about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So those two passages prove to us that uh, the gospel, which the disciples were tasked to preach and that we are also tasked to preach, uh, must be about the good news, about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. So it is important to know what the kingdom of God is, where the kingdom of God will be, so that we can teach others where the kingdom of God will be and where our reward will be. <clears throat> So next section, what, um, let's, let's prove that the gospel will be, the, sorry, the, the um, kingdom will be on earth. So by doing that, let's see what God has to say about this. So um, Numbers 14, 21, um, you will all know it, I'm sure. But truly as I live and as all the earth, oh, and I think there's a typo there, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. So is all the, the earth currently full of God's glory? No, it's not. There's terrible things that happen each and every day that don't reflect God's glory. So this is clearly talking about a future time when the whole earth will be filled with God's glory. And it's not just Numbers that says that, it's also in Habakkuk. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Psalm 115 has an interesting um, verse. The heavens are the Lord's. Heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth he has given to the children of man. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor do any man, any who go down into silence. So there's the, the, the distinguishing God's heaven and man's earth. It doesn't say man will be in heaven, does it? <clears throat> Proverbs 11 says, Behold the righteous shall be recompensed, they'll be given a reward in the earth. And Proverbs 10 verse 30 says, The righteous shall never be removed, but the wicked shall not inherit the earth. So um, telling us that the, the earth will be filled with the righteous at one day. Isaiah 2, Isaiah has some really fantastic um, prophetical sections about the coming of, of uh, the coming kingdom. And Isaiah 2 says, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke, rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and, they shall, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. So clearly it's talking about a future time. These things have not happened yet, so it must be in the future. And the he that it's referring to is Christ and he shall judge it 
among the nations and shall rebuke many people. So that sounds like quite a divine and kingly experience, doesn't it? Kingdomly experience, I should say. <clears throat> um, Isaiah 11 has another beautiful section in it, actually, and we're going to read the first 10 verses. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow up out of his roots. That's widely known and accepted to be Christ, of course, out of Jesse and um, through David. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding. That sounds like we're told in Matthew, doesn't it? The Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. He doesn't judge by what he sees, because it might not be the case. He doesn't judge by what he hears, because that might not be the case. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. So he's obviously got God's power too. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. That doesn't sound like heaven, does it? And the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them all. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. So there's going to be some physiological changes in animals too. And the suckling child shall play in the house of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign to the people, to which shall all the Gentiles seek, and his rest, the promised rest, the kingdom of rest, shall be glorious. <clears throat> so we're starting to build a pretty strong case now of what God says about a coming time on the earth, uh, which will be a kingdom of God on earth. <clears throat> what, so what did Jesus say about this topic? <clears throat> he said in the Beatitudes, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Not in heaven, of heaven. He also said, just a couple of verses later, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So there's a, there's a link there, isn't there? The kingdom of heaven must be on earth. In a, a chapter later, in Matthew 6, he's in the reading that was read for us tonight, in the Lord's Prayer, it says, Our Father which art in heaven, God is in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. It doesn't say thy will be done in heaven and bring your kingdom soon to heaven so that we can all go there. It says, Thy will be done in earth as it's also done in heaven. Matthew 8, And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> well, that has to infer a couple of things. It has to infer... Firstly, a resurrection, because Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are dead and long gone, aren't they? And um, it has to also infer a kingdom which uh, will take place on the earth. Uh, it's inferring many coming from the east and the west in the world. So these are, are probably people who are mortals in the kingdom, possibly not um, that those Im immortals. And John 14, let's read the first three verses. Let not your heart be troubled, but believe in God. Believe also in me. You believe in God, sorry. Believe also in me. In my house, in my, sorry, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So what he's saying is he's going to go away, he's going to prepare a place, but then he's coming back and he's going to bring that um, glorious kingdom to fulfilment on the earth. 
<clears throat> Let's also look at what the disciples believed. I've got a couple of quotes from Acts. Firstly, Acts um, chapter 1, and this is around the time of Christ's ascension. Um, because they were, when they were therefore come together, this is the, the day of his ascension, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of, to Israel? They were expecting that at any time. He'd, he'd been killed, he'd been raised from the dead, and now they thought this is the time when the kingdom of, of Israel is going to start. <clears throat> and in the meantime, Christ ascended to heaven, and um, they stand up gazing into heaven, and two angels appear to them which say, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, which was taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So they believed that the kingdom was going to be set up on earth because they believed that it was going to take place then. But then the word comes back to them that Christ has gone, but he will be coming back um, in the same manner. So he is coming back. Why does he need to come back if he's not setting up a kingdom on earth? Acts chapter 3 and verses 19 to 21. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When the time is refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the prophet by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So it's talking about Christ going away but also coming back at a set time and that set time is going to be to set up his kingdom so the disciples believed that he would set up his kingdom on the earth <clears throat> what about um, God's promises to Abraham and maybe we, maybe we can open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12 because they are quite elaborate. They're a, a multi-stage covenant. So you can read the background to them from Genesis chapter 12. <coughs> Pardon me. I'll just rest my voice. So the first, um, I think God appears, to, or an angel appears to to um, Abram at least four times and sets, sets out the promises at least four times. And the first of these is captured in the first couple of verses of chapter 12. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy kindred, sorry, from thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee, and make thy name great, thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So there's quite a few stages to that. There's actually four stages to that original um, blessing there, that covenant. So Abraham departed in verse 4. And then come down to verse 7. Um, and the Lord appeared unto Abraham. This is the second time he's appeared unto him now. And said unto, the, uh, and said, unto thy seed will I give this land. And there he built an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So um, Paul actually picks up, the Apostle Paul picks that up in Galatians and spends quite a bit of time talking about the um, promise made to Abraham in Galatians chapter 3. And he says in verse 16, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. And he says, he does not say unto seeds as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed, which is Christ. So the land there that is promised um, is actually promised to a seed, which is Christ. And so that Christ will actually inherit the land as its king. Let's also look, come uh, through to chapter 13 um, and verse 14 and 15, which is another phase of, of um, the blessings. And each time a, a, new, a new piece of information was given to Abraham. Chapter 13, verses 14 and 15. 
And the Lord said unto Abram, after the lot was taken from, was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed for ever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in, in the length of it and the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. So that, that would appear to have been quite a lot of land, and we know actually from um, Hebrews in chapter 11 that he actually didn't inherit. He didn't, the, all the promises were not fulfilled in his lifetime. <clears throat> so the apostle, the, the writer to the Hebrews actually picks this up in Hebrews 11. <coughs> <coughs> Pardon me. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place where he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And when he went out, not knowing whither he went, by faith he sojourned in the place of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same product, promise. Further down in verse 13, it says, Of the forefathers, these all died in faith not having received those promises, but having seen them from afar, from afar off. And then at the end of the chapter, these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. So it's talking about a reward, a promise that's promised to people who really, did, well, no one truly deserves God's promise do they? But if anyone was going to, it should be them, shouldn't it? Um, they were promised something and they still have not received it, which infers that firstly there's got to be a, a resurrection from the dead and then the promise which was fulfilled has to still come to pass. And the promise was a promise of land, um, promise to Abraham and the forefathers, which is yet to come to pass. And that's the, prom that's the same land that... Um, that Christ will come back and set up the, the kingdom of God in the land uh, as, he, as king. <clears throat> um, let's now change tack a little bit and we'll look at um, proving that um, the kingdom of God is going to be on, on earth by looking at, Neb at pro prophecy. And we're going to look at Nebuchadnezzar's image. So perhaps if you can turn with me to Daniel chapter 2 and we'll just go through um, Daniel's um, for Nebuchadnezzar's dream again, just for, to revise us. Now, Daniel 2 and uh, from verse 31. <clears throat> so you remember that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had a, king, had a dream and instead of um, telling everyone the dream and asking them for the interpretation, he said, well, no, you have to tell me the dream and the interpretation. That way I know that the interpretation is going to be true. So Daniel um, approached God and God showed him the, the dream and the interpretation thereof. <clears throat> and in verse 31, Daniel says, Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image. This great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, and his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image of his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, so that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So that's the dream. And then Daniel says, this is the dream. We will tell thee the interpretation thereof before the king. <clears throat> thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the kingdom of men dwell, the beasts of the field, the fowls of the heaven, hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another kingdom, third kingdom of brass, which shall rule over all the earth. 
and the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaks in pieces and subdues all things. And as iron that breaketh all these things, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou, whereof thou, sorry, whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. <clears throat> and in the days of the kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall be left to other people, shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces to consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest the stone was cut out of the mountains without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great king hath made known to the king what shall be come to come to pass hereafter. <coughs> the dream is certain, and the interpretation that it sure. I should have got someone else to read that for me, because my voice is feeling it now. <coughs> So, <clears throat> on the screen, we've, um, we've got a, um, an image that's um, as, maybe as um, Nebuchadnezzar would have seen it. <clears throat> and with the benefit of hindsight, well, we know that um, from the reading that the first kingdom was ruled by Nebuchadnezzar. So, this is the kingdom of Babylon. We even know the dates, um, rough dates of when it was set up to when it um, was broken down. <clears throat> um, we know too that it was replaced by the Medo-Persian Empire and there's, there's a certain amount of accuracy in this depiction too because the Medo-Persians formed an alliance to, um, to um, overthrow the Babylonians and that's why and that's, there's some accuracy with the, the two arms, um, Medo and Persian, uh, forming that strength of silver. And then there's brilliant thighs of brass, which is the Greek Empire, which we all know um, was a, a famous empire um, ruled by Alexander, which was the most famous of those uh, rulers, um, which was overthrown um, um, by the Roman Empire um, close to, or just before Christ um, in BC 67. And then um, a divided Europe. So the, the Roman um, the Roman part is also there's some really nice um, accuracy too with that because uh, the Roman Empire had two portions. There was a western and an eastern portion, so and they fell separately at two different separate times too. So there's some really nice accuracy with the two legs um, depicted by the eastern and the western portions of that empire. And then the, the feet and toes of iron and, and clay um, represent the divided Europe that now is. Um, it's divided um, such that um, iron and clay can never be mixed and they'll never agree on anything. And despite the, the best intentions of some people like Napoleon and Hitler, for example, and probably it would seem um, Putin at the moment to um, reset up a, a, a one empire in Europe, um, that has failed and it will fail because God has said <coughs> that's going to last the the, the feet and toes of iron and clay are going to last until a stone comes out of the, it, the mountain is cut without hands. <clears throat> and so this, this just shows a little bit more um, of what we've been talking about, the, the rock that's coming out to destroy the image. And um, we'll pick that up in, it was in verse... Um, Um, we might do 34, the first one. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands. <clears throat> so it was not a man-made stone. This was a stone that, that God had set up um, and which smote the image upon its feet that were of iron and clay and broke them to pieces. And then what happened? They were all broken in pieces together the inference there is all the kingdoms of men passed 
and present were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. Um, the strength of those things just became something that just got swept away and blown away like chaff. And no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So what is the stone? Um, you might have already been reading ahead and, and picked up a few things from that, but um, the stone is Christ. Um, Matt, Matt, um, Christ himself says in Matthew 21, Jesus saith unto them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same is that become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvellous in our eyes. Therefore, say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whereof shall fall on this stone, and whosoever, sorry, shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grant him to powder. And Paul picks up in Ephesians chapter 2 <clears throat> that we are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, exactly the same words used, the cornerstone. <clears throat> so, whoops, how do we go backwards? So what happens... The, um, the, the rock comes that's cut out without hands and it smites all the kingdoms of the world and then it, um, it grows and it, and it fills the whole earth and it, it consumes all kingdoms and it stands forever. Um, and it's, it finishes, Daniel finishes, The great God hath made known to the king that which shall come to pass hereafter. The dream is certain and the interpretation thereof is sure. <clears throat> so the stone that is Christ will come to, to uh, break up the, the world as we know it and set up his kingdom on earth. So I think, I hope that's enough proof to you that the future coming of God, the future kingdom of God uh, will be on earth and that our reward is on earth, uh, not in heaven and not in hell. So uh, let's just have a look at a few verses now to uh, finish off which hopefully prove that it's not in heaven and also not in earth uh, sorry not in hell so what, what how can we prove that it's not in heaven psalm 115 we have already looked at this but this is a slightly different translation the heaven even the heavens are the lord's but the earth has he given to the kingdom of men so the the the, the children of men will never inherit the kingdom it would appear uh, sorry the kingdom of men will never inherit the heavens, the heaven. John 3 verse 13 says, No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. The inference there is that no, man, no other man will ascend up to heaven either. And Matthew in various um, places talks about the kingdom on, of heaven. Um, and rightly so, um, also he talks about the kingdom of God because the kingdom of heaven is also of God and it is divine and it is um, heavenly. So it does not mean, though, that it is going to be in heaven. It's of heaven. <clears throat> what about um, hell? So hell really simply is just the grave and there's three words that are used in the Bible to uh, describe or have been translated as hell. Those are, um, the Hebrew word is Sheol in the Old Testament and in the New Testament there's two words that are both Greek, Hades and Gehenna. And they all basically mean the grave or the pit. And let's prove this by looking at some of those translations, okay? Um, in Ecclesiastes um, 9, um, there's, a, there's a word, the same word in the, in the Hebrew that's rendered grave in this particular situation. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything, neither know have they any more reward. For the memory of them is forgotten, also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. That sounds pretty final. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, 
whither thou goest. So that word grave is also is the same word that's um, that's that's um, that's translated as hell in other places. Um, that's just Sheol. What about Psalm Psalm forty nine verse fourteen? Like sheep they are laid in the grave. It's the same word, Sheol. It doesn't mean hell. Death shall feed on them, and the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning, and their beauty shall consume in the grave from their dwelling. And also in Job, he's talking about death. He says, There <clears throat> the wicked cease from troubling, and there, there the weary be at rest. There the prisoners rest together. They hear not the voice of the oppressor. The small and the great are there, and the servant is free from his master. So it can't be a hell as some people understand it to be a, a terrible place of judgment, um, of wrath, etc. Because the small and the great are there, and the servant and the master, but the servant's free from his master. So it's just talking about the literal grave where we all go to, to die and to consume away, to be, um, yeah. What about um, in the New Testament? There's two words. The first of those is Hades. So in Acts chapter 2, um, it says, Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And that's obviously talking about Christ, Christ's body. So <clears throat> they've obviously used translated that word Hades there as hell. But when it says to leave it there, implies that it went there. So we know that Christ didn't go to a hell, did he? So that can't be right. So it must just be the grave where things go to corrupt, where bodies go to corrupt and break down. And it says that he could not go, not, not stay there. It's, he went there to the grave, but could not stay there because he could not suffer the Holy One to seek corruption. <clears throat> So that's Hades. The other word that's translated um, hell, which is associated with hell fire, in fact, is actually Gehenna. Um, Matthew 18 says, Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life, halt or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire, uh, or hell fire, as some would translate that. It's the same word into Gehenna. Um, and Gehenna, as it turns out, is actually derived from the words Gehinom, the Hebrew Gehinom, which is the valley of Hinnom. And it's a valley that was previously used for idol worship and idolatry, but then turned into a continuously burning dump, which was close to Jerusalem, and it was used at the time of Christ. And that's why Christ refers to it. Um, but it does not mean a hellfire, as some people come to think of it. So I hope um, with those words that you agree with me and believe with me that the earth is God's reward, not heaven or hell, and look forward to a reward that's one day going to take place in God's kingdom on the earth. Thank you. Thanks for that, Mick. Um, next week, we will go back to our um, usual Bible class program. Just trying to bring up what that is um, with um, Ben Pitcher looking at building hope. Um, and then uh, the next seminar that we have is um, on November the 30th and to the subject God's solutions to man's doomed world so perhaps uh, it's a bit of a follow-on from tonight's um, subject if we're all going to live on the earth what's it going to be like
We'll um, now close with prayer and thanks for supper afterwards. Come before you at this time, Heavenly Father, to thank you for the time that we have spent considering your plan and purpose with this earth and with us. We pray that you will help us to understand and be convicted of your message and those things that we have heard this evening. We especially look forward to that time when your kingdom will be set up on earth and we pray for that time to come when your will will be done on the earth and there will be perfect peace and prosperity. We look forward to that time when all the faithful will be rewarded with life eternal in your kingdom. And we thank you for the many blessings that you provide for us day by day, knowing that all good things come from you. We thank you for the supper that you have provided for us that we can enjoy together. We thank you for the time that we can spend together learning with fellow believers. We pray that you will watch over us and keep us safe until your son returns, in whose name we offer this prayer, even the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.